All right, we'll record. All right. Okay, well, good morning to everyone. So good, good to morning. be here uh, this morning and share with you from God's precious word. We'd like you to turn, please, to the book of Acts, chapter 14. And we're at the halfway point, the 28 chapters in the book of Acts. And now we've reached chapter 14. I'm going to look at the first 20 verses, but for the sake of reading, I want to read from verse 8 down to verse 20, although we will certainly consider the entire chapter the section from verse 1 through 20. So verse 8, Acts 14, it says, And there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly, beholding him and perceiving that he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and walked. And when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in the speech of Lycaonia, the gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. And they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius because he was the chief speaker. Then the priest of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands unto the gates and would have done sacrifice on, with the people, which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of, they rent their clothes and ran in among the peoples, crying out and saying, Sirs, why do ye these things? We also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities to the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein, who in time past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Nevertheless, he left not himself without witness in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And with these sayings, scarce restrained they the people that they had not done sacrifice unto them. And they came to the certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium, who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Howbeit, as the disciples stood around about him, he rose up and came into the city. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. And again, God will bless that reading of this precious word. Well, the theme of this chapter, uh, it, but particularly this first section, is opposition to God's work. As we, we continue our journey through the book of Acts, we, we're on this first missionary journey at this present time, and the missionary team uh, had just been expelled from the region of Pisidian Antioch in the previous chapter, in verses 50 and 51 of the previous chapter. But, but they, nevertheless, they, they still were rejoicing. Uh, it tells us in verse 52 of uh, Acts 13, the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Ghost, even though they'd been expelled from that city. And the reason was that there'd been a great response to the preaching. Even though the Jews got them expelled, there were many of the Gentiles that had believed the gospel and been saved, and some of the Jews as well. And so really, it's, it's a, a true statement to say this. That when God is blessing, we can expect opposition. So be prepared for that. Yeah. One of the things that one of the great heroes in my life, uh, a man called Vern Bartlett, I remember he used to say this over and over again. He used to say this, no true work of God will ever go unopposed. That's good to remind ourselves. No true work of God will ever go unopposed. And we're going to observe the following things as we look at this chapter. First of all, where the opposition generally comes from. Always good to know where this, this opposition is coming from. And secondly, how do the opposition organize themselves? What are their tactics? How do they work? And thirdly, how should we respond in the face of opposition? So we're going to look at those things. So in verses 1 through 7, 
I want to kind of give a, a, a kind of simple title to these first seven verses, Proclamation and Poison. Proclamation and Poison. We're going to see that the apostles proclaimed the word of God and the Jews poisoned the minds of those who were responding to the word of God. So proclamation and poison. And so it says in verse one, it came to pass in Iconium, they went both together into the synagogue of the Jews and spake that a great multitude, both of Jews and also of the Greeks, believed. So as they they leave Pisidian Antioch, they make their way now to a new location, Iconium. And quite clearly, there's great blessing. Uh, they go into the synagogue, their usual strategy, remember, to the Jew first. They know they're going to get a hearing there. They know also the people have got two thirds of the story. They just need to hear the rest of the story. And so they're kind of a people that have got the Old Testament background. And so they would go there and they would preach the gospel to them. And of course, uh, the result was wonderful. Great multitude, both of the Jews and also of the Greeks. Now, the, again, these are the proselyte Jews. Uh, they're, they're Gentiles, but they're sick of paganism. They've started coming to the synagogue. Some of them have even become Jews. They've, they've been baptized and been brought into Judaism. Uh, some of them are just God-fearers. They're just there because they, they fear God and they want to hear from the word of God. But nevertheless, they believe the, the message concerning the Lord Jesus. Uh, they believe the gospel that was being preached and they responded to it. And so everything seems wonderful, doesn't it? Great multitude responding to the word of God. But I want you to notice the next word in chapter two it just starts this way, but. <laughs> Everything's going marvelous, but. <laughs> and he, it's, there's always a but, isn't there? Somewhere there's always a but. Everything's going wonderful, but. And it says this, the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. So what is, what is the opposition doing here? The opposition is somehow poisoning the minds of the people against the, the missionaries and using the usual methodology of slander, a smear campaign, whatever. You, you remember the tongue? Uh, the tongue is an interesting instrument, isn't it? Uh, one of the things, the tongue, tongue can be a, a great blessing to us uh, as we, we hear good news, right? I mean, the tongue was a blessing when the gospel came into it, and it was using the tongue that the gospel was preached and the glad tidings were brought. And so the tongue is a good thing, but the tongue can also be a poisonous thing. I want you just to look at a couple of scriptures that would say this. Romans chapter 3, verse 13 it says their throat is an open sepulcher with their tongues. They have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips. And so they're, they're, it's like a snake bite <laughs> that comes out of their mouth. It's deadly. Uh, it's very poisonous. Uh, look at James chapter three and verse eight. And again, about the tongue, how it can be a, a source of great blessing a great encouragement, but it also can be quite poisonous. And James chapter 3, verse 8, <clears throat> James says this. He says, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. And so <clears throat> what's going on here is that the minds of those that are listening to the word of God are being poisoned, evil affected by the unbelieving Jews. And by the way, there's a warning here to Christians because uh, we, we need to be careful that we don't use our tongues to poison people's minds about one another, what we call slander. Uh, I just want to read one verse from Titus. And uh, as the, uh, the Apostle Paul is talking to the older sisters and not that they're the only ones that could be capable of this uh, but he says in verse three the aged women likewise that they be in behavior as becometh holiness not false accusers nor given to much wine teachers of good things so what he says is one of the one of the dangers one of the possible propensities of older sisters 
is that they can be false accusers. That word false accusers in the Greek language is this, diabolos. You ever heard that word before? What does it mean? Devils. It says all the sisters don't do the devil's work for him. Right? He loves to slander. He lo and especially he loves to speak badly of the saints. He's an accuser of the brethren, right? He loves to, he loves to speak bad of God's people. And so the, the word here is, listen, uh, older sister, but again, it's not just, they, they don't have the corner of the market on this. <laughs> uh, it, any of us can be guilty of this. Okay. Be careful that you do not do the devil's work for him. He's doing a pretty good job of slandering God's people as it is without your help or my help. In fact, instead, let's use our tongues to speak good where we can speak good. <laughs> let's speak good. And if we can't speak good, maybe don't speak. <laughs> Just be quiet. But be careful about this. So this is what they're doing. They're poisoning the minds. Minds evilly affected against the brethren. Look at verse 3. It says, Long time therefore abode they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto uh, the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. So how did the apostles respond to this? They're, they're being spoken badly about. Uh, people's minds are being affected and poisoned. But they didn't quit. They didn't run away. They stayed. They, they stayed and kept on preaching despite the opposition. They didn't go home and have a pity party. They just kept on keeping on preaching the word of God. That's a good lesson for all of us. What do we do when people just keep on, keep on doing the right thing, keep on saying the right thing, keep on being the right person. You just keep on being God's man and leave your reputation and your testimony to him. One of the things I found is one of the, 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 the most sensible things when you're being attacked is not to defend yourself. Let the Lord be your defender. Let him do it. Right? Don't, don't, don't you, whatever you say, to people like this, they're going to twist it anyway. That they're, they're not going to hear what you're saying anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, and particularly, if don't, whatever you do, don't put anything in writing. You put something in writing, every word will be analyzed and twisted. Just leave it with the Lord. You can spend all your time trying to uh, trying to you know kind of uh, deal with your. Let the Lord look after your reputation. He's more than capable of doing that. And so they did. They they just kept on preaching despite it. And God authenticated the ministry of these men by granting them signs and wonders to be done by their hands. Now, I want to just talk about signs and wonders just for a minute. Sign simply means a miracle that conveys a message. Okay, because a sign points to something. So the miracles conveyed a message. The message was these men are authentic men and their message is an authentic message, right? Uh, sign convey and then wonders it just refers to the, the the usual response to the sign is that it leaves people in wonder because it's it's so different to what we're used to uh it, it's it's a a, a one that causes a sense of awe and wonder uh this last week my wife and i had a an awe and wonder moment uh, we were at the grand canyon and we just had to stop and worship. I mean, it was a sense of awe and wonder. The wonder of God's creation is seen so magnificently there that you just have to worship. I, I, I challenge you, if you've never been, go and see if you can go there and not worship. You have to. It's amazing. <clears throat> but these miracles, they, they left people with a sense of awe. They, they really did because they, there was nothing dubious. We're going to see that as we go on in this passage. The New Testament miracles... There was nothing iffy about them. They were absolutely clear. <laughs> they were so real. So, so the point is that God actually vindicated his servants here. And, and it's amazing too, isn't it? That How can they keep going in the face of such opposition? Well, the boldness and the perseverance of the servants of God here is not natural. It's supernatural. Just as our children's illustration... God was helping them, despite tremendous opposition, to keep on proclaiming the truth. And God always promises that if we're about his business, he will provide the help needed, right? He, he will uh, supply what we need. 
So notice it says, but the multitude of the city was divided, part held with the Jews and part with the apostles. And we could say this, that truth brought division. Truth brought division. I want to just show you this because it's something we should expect, that truth brings division. Let me show you. Look at the Gospel of John. John chapter 7 and verse 43. <clears throat> Speaking of the Lord Jesus, it says, So there was a division among the people because of him. Well, who is he? He's the truth, isn't he? <laughs> the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. And it says there was a division because of him. Actually, he's ultimately going to divide humanity into the saved and the unsaved. Those that go to heaven, those that go to hell. What's going to divide the human race? It's what they do with this man, Jesus Christ. Uh, he's the divider. And, and so it says there was great division because of this man. Look at John 9, verse 16. John chapter 9, verse 16. It says, therefore, said some of the Pharisees, this man is not of God because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, how can a man that is a sinner do such miracles? And there was a division among them. John chapter 10, verse 19. It says, there was a division, therefore, again, among the Jews for these sayings. So what we can say is, that truth does divide. That's why our nation is so divided right now. Because there are some that are just telling lie after lie after lie. And there's some that are telling the truth. And it always causes division. The United States of America is not so united right now. And why is that? Because truth always divides. It causes division. And that's where we are today. There's division. And it's, uh, it's, it's so true to see this. Now, notice as well, just an aside here, but it says, part sided with the apostles. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? Because who is he talking about? It says apostles, plural, but it's Paul and Barnabas. It's interesting, isn't it? First time, by the way, that Paul is ever called an apostle. We call him that all the time. We talk about the Apostle Paul, but this is the first time it happens. Up to this point, it's always when the term apostles is being used, it's always been used just of the 12. But now it's used of Paul. It's also used of Barnabas. That's interesting, isn't it? So we have to ask ourselves what's going on here. We know that there's the original 12 that were commissioned by the Lord Jesus that were uh, so accompanied with him uh, from the very beginning uh, and even were witnesses of his death, bill, and resurrection. And then as the Apostle Paul, we know about him. He's the apostle to the Gentiles, right? And the word apostle means somebody sent with a mission or sent with a commission. But now there's a, maybe a secondary sense in which these men were sent, remember, from the church at Antioch. And they were sent with a mission. So maybe it's kind of a what we would call them today missionaries, wouldn't we? We'd use that term. Uh, but but again, they're sent with a with a with a commission. Uh, they're sent with a with a mission. And so certainly uh, it's in that secondary sense that it's used here of these individuals. And so notice now again in verse five, things began to deteriorate. It says, and when there was an assault made, both of the Gentiles and also of the Jews with their rulers to use them despitefully and to stone them. And so this opposition gets stronger to the point where now there's a plan to actually stone these men to death. And they hear about it. The word gets out. They were aware of it, verse 6, and fled to Lystra and Derby, cities of life, Caonia, unto the region that lieth round about. Now, we might ask the question, well, were they cowards now i mean they stayed but now they're leaving <laughs> so it's kind of interesting that they're going to go back there when we get to verse 21 so obviously they're not scared because they go back to the very same place look at verse 21 when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many they returned again to lystra and to iconium and antioch so they go back to the very same place 
uh, just uh, talking last night, I gave a little message on John Senek, who wrote the first hymn we sang this morning, Brethren, Let Us Join to Bless. And uh, he was preaching in Dublin, Ireland, and saw a great number of people converted, and even the priests were listening avidly as this man preached the gospel in Dublin. And people up north heard about him in Ballymena, the capital of Presbyterianism in Northern Ireland. And so they called for him to come, but they hated his message. And he was chased out of town with a man with a horse whip. And, and, and they were very successful in getting him with the horse whip. And so he left and he went away, but he came back two years later. This man's not a coward. He came back to the very same place and saw 20 churches established in that area and 40 Moravian societies in the next five years. Amazing. God did a great work through. So these men are not cowards, but they just thought it was better to move on at this point, <laughs> no point in getting stoned. But, you know, it's not like we're scared, but there's no point getting stoned for the sake of it. Later on, he's going to get stoned in this very chapter. So, so they move on, <clears throat> and notice they just continued doing the same thing. Verse seven, it says, "And there, they preached the gospel." This is Lystra, Derby, cities of Lycaonia. There, they preached the gospel. <clears throat> Notice verse 8, it says, There sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb who never had walked. So Luke gives us a threefold description of a man that they encounter. Basically, there's no strength in his feet. That's the idea of impotent, no power. He has no strength in his He can't move his feet. Uh, we, we were with a, a family this last week, and uh, they had a boy who was uh, uh, brain damaged uh, through a uh, a medical mistake. Uh, he went in for a hernia surgery. They gave him way too much um, anesthesia, and he came out um, crippled. And so we had to help him get in and out of the vehicle and stuff like that. And, and he, he, he was impotent. He couldn't, he couldn't move. And so we had to move him. So this man is like that. He has no strength in his feet. He was a cripple from childbirth, and he had never walked and so he's piling on the description because he wants us to see this wonder that god is about to do you see because but he's showing th this is humanly speaking we would say this is a hopeless case and yet verse 9 it says the same heard paul speak who steadfastly beholding him and perceiving that he had faith to be healed. So he's paying attention as Paul preaches, but Paul's paying attention as well. And he notices this guy and he notices how captivated he is. And he, and he comes to a conclusion, this guy has faith to be healed. And he believes it. Uh, he perceives he has faith. Now, how could Paul perceive that? Well, let me just say this. What was Paul preaching? We know that verse seven, there they preached the gospel. That's his message, a gospel message. And this man's believing it. No doubt in the cause of telling the gospel, he's talking about the Lord Jesus. No doubt he talked about some of the healings and the miracles Jesus did. And as this man listens to it, it's like he, the light goes on. He sees it. He believes this. And Paul sees that he does. You know, because the Bible is very clear. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And this man's hearing the word of God and he's believing it. And so what does Paul do? In verse 10, it says, he said with a loud voice, stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and walked. Now, just think about this. This guy has never before in his life walked. You see what I'm saying about New Testament miracles? <clears throat> Nothing iffy about this, right? Nothing dubious about this guy has never walked. And, and so even if you could heal him today, what would you do? He'd be in physiotherapy for a long time. He'd have to learn to walk. He's never walked. He'd have to learn. Not when the Lord does a miracle. He's leaping. <laughs> the guy's hopping around like a bunny rabbit. I mean, the guy is just full of life and energy. And so it's an amazing, amazing, undeniable miracle. Now, I don't have to remind you of anything. 
remember in chapter three of Acts, remember Peter and John went up to the temple? Remember there was a guy there at the temple <laughs> and uh, uh, he, he was looking for arms. We know the story, right? And he, instead he got legs, remember? And he, he was, <laughs> he, he was <laughs> walking and leaping and praising God. Amen. And so here it's kind of amazing that one of the very and, and Peter saw that he had faith as well. So it's it's kind of almost the same story, but now it's Paul. And again, what is it doing? It's vindicating Paul as a servant of God in a very real way, not inferior to the very chiefest of the apostles, Paul was saying. And so a tremendous miraculous sign, but there's a big difference in this sign to previous ones. And we're going to see that <clears throat> what's different about this is the audience. You notice that it didn't say they went to the synagogue this time. The implication is there wasn't a synagogue in that. So he's not speaking to Jews. He's speaking to Gentiles. And that's significant because you see the sign gifts really primarily were designed for the nation of Israel. Let me just prove that to you. Look at the book of um, 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 22. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 22 says this, for the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. Let's go back to John's gospel. Just notice again some of this Emphasis on the Jews being a sign oriented people. John's Gospel, chapter 2, verse 11. It says, This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. Notice chapter 3, verse 2. Nicodemus comes to the Lord Jesus. Then the same came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no one can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. And you'll see all the way through the book of John that these miracles are designed for one purpose. They were, you see, they were, Jews were taught that when Messiah comes, how do we know that he's the Messiah? And he said, well, the Messiah comes, you'll see certain evidences. He says, the blind will receive their sight. The, leap will, uh, the, the lame will leap as in heart, right? And, and so it, these signs were designed to show the Jewish people, this is your Messiah. This is the one you've been waiting for. He, he's fulfilling all the credentials. He's showing them who he really is. But they weren't designed for Gentiles. Because Gentiles, well, they seek after wisdom. So now they're doing a sign miracle, but they're doing it for Gentiles. Now, God allows them to do it. I want you to see the response. Because it doesn't go quite according to plan. They don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. They believe the miracle workers are gods. <laughs> See, it's a confused response, isn't it? Just, just notice it carefully. And so verse 11, it says, when the people saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices saying the speech of Lycaonia, the gods are come down to us in the likeness of man. Mm -hmm. Now, it's interesting that they, they, in their excitement, Paul no doubt was preaching to them in the Greek language, which was the language of commerce and trade. Uh, they are... Now, in their excitement, they revert to their own native language. And so they're, they're speaking the, the language of the Lyconians, and they're busily doing this uh, and talking. And what they're saying is the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Notice, just pause here, look at Acts 28. I want you to see a similar response again when signs are done before Gentiles and not Jews. Acts 28, verse 3, it says, When Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hang on his hand, they said among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm, howbeit they looked 
when he should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly, but after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said that he was a god. Now, isn't that interesting? When signs are done before Gentiles, they always come to the wrong conclusion. The worker of the miracle in their minds is a living deity. <clears throat> that's what they say. He's a God. And that's what they believe. So <clears throat> certainly confused initial response here. And when it proceeds, it says that gods have come down from us. They, they called Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius because he was the chief speaker. Now, some of your translations uh, may have, uh, instead of Jupiter, uh, they'll have Zeus, uh, the chief of the gods, and then instead um, of Mercury, they'll have Hermes. And again, th there's a reason for that, and that is that in the King James, they, they basically are using the Roman names for these deities. In the other translations, they're using the Greek names for these deities, mm -hmm. but it's speaking of the same people. So uh, in uh, Greek mythology, um, Hermes uh, is the same as Mercurius in Roman mythology. Same person. So <clears throat> they identified them in, in different ways. Uh, first of all, uh, they say uh, that, that the chief of the gods, Zeus, well, that's Barnabas. Now, why did they pick him and say he's the chief of the gods? And then Paul's just the spokesman for the gods, Hermes. Why do they do that? Well, it's kind of interesting. They, they do that. Perhaps the reason is, I, I can't be dogmatic about this, but maybe Barnabas had a more dignified bearing about him than Paul. Because all we know about Paul was he was a, a bald, short Jew with a big crooked nose and bow legs. He doesn't look very godlike. I mean, these are the descriptions that we have of the Apostle Paul. In our minds, he's a superhero, you know, with his, pulls back his shirt, he's a super Christian. But that's what he really looked like. That's why he said in bodily presence, uh, he, he was weak. Uh, he, he wasn't Superman. And so Barnabas, well, he looked a bit more dignified. But Paul was doing all the talk, talking. So they said, well, he's the spokesman for the gods. <laughs> and so that's basically why they do that. Now, um, what, what they do is kind of interesting now, but in verse 12, their response, it, it says, they called Barnabas Jupiter, Paul Mercurius, because he was the chief speaker, and the priest of Jupiter, which was before their city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and would have done sacrifice to the people. Now, let's just think about this for a moment. There's, there's a background here that is, is interesting. Uh, again, we, we learn an, an ancient myth concerning a visit of Zeus and Hermes to the neighboring region of Phrygia, disguised as mere mortals. And it turns all, all of the people in Phrygia turned away these mere mortals who were really gods disguised as mere mortals, except one couple, Philemon and Baucis. They took them in, this one couple. Later on, a flood came and drowned all the people in the area except this couple. And so, apparently, the people of Lystra did not want to make the same mistake. And so, they were going to give these, uh, these uh, deities appearing as men a warm and rapturous welcome. And they planned to make sacrifice to the supposed divine visitors. And again, all this is going on in the local dialect. So Paul and Barbas are not necessarily picking up everything that's being said. But when the penny drops and they realize exactly what's being planned here, it says in verse 14, which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people, crying out and saying, sirs, why do you these things? So notice what they do. They, they run in amongst them and they tear their garments. Now, that, this is a very Jewish uh, demonstrative way of showing horror. Uh, remember when uh, in, in the Gospel of Matthew and chapter 26, uh, when the Lord Jesus uh, basically was before the Sanhedrin and the high priest, 
And we just notice something that goes on here, Matthew 26, verse 61, and, and, and said, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said to him, answerest thou nothing? What is it which thou witness against these witness against thee? Jesus held his peace. And the high priest answered and said to him, I adjure thee by the living God. In other words, he puts him under oath that thou shalt tell us whether thou be the Christ, the son of God. Jesus saith unto him, thou hast said, nevertheless, I say unto you, hereafter shall you see the son of man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, he hath spoken blasphemy. What further need we have witnesses? Behold, now you have heard the blasphemy. What think ye? They answered and said, he is guilty of death. And so this tearing the garments, it was a shock and horror that what was going on. And so they, they were showing their disdain, their disgust, that, that they, mere men, were being made out to be gods. And they said, this is, uh, we, this is uh, horrendous. We don't want this. Says, we're just men. And I like this. We're men of the same nature as you are. Isn't that good to know? Please don't put the Lord's servants on a pedestal. They're all made of the same cookie dough. When you put the Lord's servants on a pedestal, you're setting yourself up for disappointment. The best of men are men at best. We're going to see our heroes here, Paul and Barnabas, are going to have a big fight pretty soon. <laughs> and they're going to show that they got, certainly they, these men are feet of clay. Only one perfect man ever walked this earth. Only one is worthy of exaltation. And that's the Lord Jesus. And so uh, they, they're horrified at what's going on. And they said, we're, we're just men. We're just like you. We're made of the, uh, the same thing you are. We're men of like passions with you. And, and we're, what, what we're here to do is bring you a message and preach to you that you should turn from these vanities Unto the living God, which made heaven and earth and the sea and all things that are therein. And so notice again their message. They don't go back to the Old Testament. Remember, every time up to now, all the sermons, it's all been about the Old Testament proving that Jesus is the Messiah and that he rise from the dead. But they're not speaking to Jews. They're speaking to Gentiles. They don't have the Old Testament background. So what do they do? They go back to creation. He is the one who made the heavens and the earth and all things that are therein. And that tells us something. We have to fit our message to suit our audience, right? No point. If you go to a synagogue, by all means, preach from the Old Testament and show them that this is Christ. <laughs> but when you're dealing with people increasingly in our culture who have no background anymore, used to be, Kids went to Sunday school and they had all the basic stories and you could you could basically use. Now we're dealing with basically a pagan culture. That's the world we're in. So we've got to go back to the message of creation. That's a challenge in itself because they don't even believe that. But this is what they do. They go and they begin at creation and, and they talk about the fact that these people should turn from these vanities unto the living God. Interesting, this worshipping of Zeus uh, or, uh, and uh, Hermes and all of these so-called Greek deities or Roman deities, he calls them vanities. Turn away from them. Turn away. And again, it might be a challenge to ask ourselves, are there vanities in our lives that we need to turn from, repent of, and turn ourselves to the living God? Because there's plenty of vanities in our culture that would take up all our affections and all our time and ultimately not help us one bit. And so they're challenged to repent, turn away uh, from these vanities and <clears throat> turn from these vanities to the living God, which made heaven and earth and sea and all things that are in, who in time past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. It's kind of an interesting statement, isn't it? What he's telling us is this. That God, in previous centuries, has only really dealt with one nation, Israel. Other nations have been dealt with as they relate to Israel, but really, God called Abraham, and he dealt with 
the descendants of Abraham. And really from Genesis 12 all the way through to the book of Acts, God has been dealing with one nation. But now something's changing because he says, again, just the wording is interesting, who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. In other words, now God is dealing with the Gentiles as well. And that's a wonderful thing. It's, it's showing us, too, that there is such a thing as progressive revelation. That God is revealing himself progressively to the human race. In the past, he let all nations go their own way. But now, he's coming to Lystra. And he's speaking to the people there about the creator of the universe. So, by the way, it's a terrible thing, isn't it? When nations choose their own way rather than God's way. God allows it. He's not going to say to America, listen, you should go my way. If you want to go your own way, he's going to say, how about it? I'm going to let you go your own way. But you'll be better off if you follow my way. <laughs> but men are stubborn and foolish, and they want to go their own way. And we know what happens when nations choose their own way rather than God's way. When people ignore the word, the results are always tragic. And we're seeing it before our very eyes. And so verse 17, it says, nevertheless, he left not himself without a witness. So even though he wasn't giving divine revelation in terms of scripture to the Gentiles, it wasn't that he left himself without revelation to them. There was the revelation of creation, right? The, na the natural revelation. He didn't leave himself without a witness in that he did good and gave us rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. And so, you know, God was, was good to the nations, even though they didn't have anything to do with him. He still gave his rain and gave them food and gave them gladness and joys and all of these things. And it's amazing isn't it, how God good, is, good God is that these very people that would perhaps curse the name of God and ridicule him, he feeds them. He gives them the facility of speech. That's amazing, isn't it? Uh, he gives them the intellect. He gives them everything they have. God is good, period, to all mankind. There's no question about that. And, and he tells us that, 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 um, uh, that even if a society rejects him and turns from him, God still does good. He allows rain to fall upon the just and the unjust. He allows food to be produced. He allows hearts to be filled with gladness. He allows people to have life and experience the joy of a sunrise, uh, to enjoy the beauties. Unbelievers were at the Grand Canyon. They were looking at it. They weren't looking at the same eyes that I was looking for, it, but they were looking at it. And they were seeing the magnificence of it all, but it didn't lead them to all worship and wonder. But God allows them to see all this stuff. God's patience with the human race is beyond our comprehension. Mankind that doesn't want anything to do would rather worship a created thing like a snake or some other repulsive creature. <laughs> they would worship that rather than God. And yet God's still good to them. Instead of rising up in his wrath and pouring out his vials upon the earth, he pours out blessings upon them. Now, there is a day coming when he's going to pour out vials upon the earth. Not right now. God has been good to these nations, filling them with gladness. And with these sayings, scarcely restrained they the people that they had not done sacrifice unto them. And then things take a, a negative twist. But before that, we just might say this. Just a simple thing from Scripture. The goodness of God leads thee to repentance. Part of the God's goodness is to draw men to repent, to believe on the gospel. And, and the same God that provided food and all these good things has also provided a savior. And that's why the apostles are in, like Aeonia, to tell the message that there's one who came down from heaven with the express purpose of saving mankind from their sin by dying as their substitute on the center cross and bearing the punishment that they deserved. He, God's goodness is great. The greatest display of the goodness of God is seen at the cross of Calvary. That's where it's seen. And so the, 
apostles bring this message, but people can be very fickle because it says in verse 19, there came there the certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people and have stoned Paul, having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. So Jews from Antioch and Iconium finally catch up with the apostle Paul. They're following, they're dogging his footsteps. Wherever he goes, they're following him. And again, they're poisoning the, the minds of the multitude to stone the very people who a few moments earlier, they were ready to worship. And isn't that, again, the fickleness of the heart of man? And, and so they thought they'd succeeded. They, they dragged him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. But and Paul could say, once I was stoned, 2 Corinthians eleven twenty five. 25. He bore in his body the marks of Jesus Christ, right? The, the, this left an indelible impression on this man's body. If you were stoned to death, isn't it interesting that he was party to the stoning of Stephen, and now he himself is being stoned? Mm -hmm. And yet, amazingly, verse 20, howbeit as the disciples stood around about him. I wonder what they were doing. I think they might have been praying. <laughs> they certainly were there to encourage him, weren't they? And somehow the prayers, the encouragement, and God's mercy, it says, as the disciples stood around about him, he rose up and came into the city. And the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derby. Isn't that amazing? You see, we could say this. Expect opposition. We should expect it. But let me just give you a promise. You are immortal until your work on earth is done. Nobody can kill you until God says your work is finished. Nobody. You're immortal for his work. And, he, and his work wasn't done. God still had places for Paul to go. And so he goes from being stoned and left for dead, and then he gets up, which is amazing, and then the next day he goes to another town. And guess what he does? Starts all over again. He didn't come home on furlough. And, uh, you know, get psychiatric treatment because he's just been stoned. He goes to the very next town and preaches again. Amazing. So what can we learn? Expect opposition. We're involved in the conflict of the ages. And sa Satan's favorite tool is religion as his instrument for persecution. Going back to Genesis 4, a religious man slew a righteous man. The way of Cain. Remember Cain and Abel? Ever since then, the Lord Jesus would say of the Pharisees of his day, you are of your father, the devil. Right? And the greatest opposition, and there's no greater, as it were, bitterness and venom than religious hatred. By the way, today, we might just say this, that secular humanism is a religion. So don't be surprised if the alphabet people begin to persecute us, that's already happening. They are following a religion. By the way, big religion right now, climate change. That is a religion. It really is. All of this stuff, it's religion. Sign gifts inappropriately used result in confusion, confusion and false worship. Just throw that out there. But I, I think you can see it from the word of God. There's a purpose for the sign gifts. The Jews are the purpose. And then we might say this. It's, it's good to respond to the goodness of God. God is so good. Amen. Even to the, even to the people who hate him, he's still good to them. <laughs> Every single day, they enjoy his blessings. Mm -hmm. That's an amazing thing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. But there's a purpose. It's meant to bring men to repentance and to put their faith in the greatest act of the goodness of God in sending his son to die on Calvary to pay the penalty of their sin. May God encourage us with this, these thoughts from this chapter. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful for the word of God. And uh, we pray again that he would help us to have more of a heart like Paul and Barnabas for spreading the good news despite opposition, expecting opposition, but expecting blessing as well. And Father, we just see as we go through the book of Acts, it seems like everywhere these men went, 
there was riot, but there was revival. And Lord, we we just pray that we'd be willing to experience the riot so we can see the revival. Look to thee to help us in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you.